I hate museums. I don't like paintings. I get bored. I stand on my feet, and my feet get tired. Get me out of here. I'm going to tell you a love story. I'm going to tell you about my business. And then I want to tell you about why museums matter. I didn't always like museums uh, until I had this experience. A woman brought me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is it. It's the second most popular museum in the entire world. It's in New York City. It's the biggest, greatest museum in New York City. And yet, to many New Yorkers, it's simply a tourist attraction. It's a place that you go maybe once a year when your parents come to visit. I didn't have a relationship with it. I had been there before, but I didn't really connect until this thing happened. It was our third date. A woman brought me there on a romantic date. And it was the middle of winter. It was snowy out, and it was dark outside. The museum looked a little bit like this. And as she walked me around, showing me pieces that she was excited about, sculptures and paintings and rooms of furniture, something happened. I don't know if it was the lighting or if it was the space, or if it was just having a very attractive woman talk to me <laughs> about things that she was truly excited about. But that night, I fell in love with the museum. <laughs> I became obsessed with the Metropolitan Museum of Art every weekend. I began going there. I didn't work in museums or in art. I sold electronic equipment for military planes and private jets. But to me, this place unleashed a curiosity about history that I never had before. I would go there with an audio guide or on official museum tours or with a handbook in hand, and I would explore. I went into every single room that was open to the public, and I snuck into some rooms that were not. I loved this space, and I decided for my birthday, my 30th birthday, that I would treat myself and to my friends, I would become their tour guide. I would show them things that I loved. These are some photographs from that weekend. This is me at the museum. I walked them around over multiple tours on a long weekend, and I showed them things that I truly cared about. I loved being a tour guide. I loved sharing this museum with my friends and getting them excited about a space that had come to mean so much to me. They told their friends, and their friends told their friends. I did these tours for free. It was a passion project. I worked during the week, and on weekends, I did this for fun. I wanted to be the best tour guide in the world. People liked my tours because I showed them not sophisticated things. I showed them 10 cool objects I found at the Met and three pieces that I wanted to steal. <laughs> Pieces like this, a late 17th century case for a Goa stone. It's made entirely out of gold. Goa stones were these man-made objects, basically calcium deposits that the Jesuit priests would create. They would hold these balls that had mythical, magical qualities. They believed if you were sick, you could shave off a piece into your cup of tea and it would heal you. I like to get my friends on the tours. We get on our hands and knees, and we look at the detail. And we literally press our faces to the glass, and we think about all the things we would put inside of this after we stole it. <laughs> things like cookies and candies. I became obsessed with the museum. I fell in love with it. As I started to learn more about museums and visit them all around the world, I developed a very simple theory. <laughs> museums are fucking awesome. <laughs> and yet, 
so few of my friends felt the same way. They said, I don't like this place. I'm bored. Paintings don't mean anything to me. Get me out of here. About a year ago, I quit my job, and I've devoted my life to my new business. It's called Museum Hack. It's one thing to be a tour guide. It's another thing to make a business and create something around that. Today, I'm proud to say we have about 12 tour guides on staff. We are entirely self-funded. We are a renegade museum tour guide company. We do not receive any funding or even approval from the museums <laughs> that we tour at. People pay money to go on our tours. That's how we exist. They pay us between $39 and up to $89 a piece to go on this private adventure where we show them through the museum. I'd like to next tell you about my business and what we do and what makes it special and why people pay to join our tours. The heart and soul of our company is built around our tour guides. This is one of them. His name is Miles. We hire people who lead their tours with passion and excitement. We don't let art history lead our mission. We want people to be engaged and we want to share that enthusiasm. When I hire guides, I say, explore the museum, find the pieces that you love and we'll build a tour around that. I tell people that half of what we do has nothing to do with art and everything to making you feel comfortable in the space. When you show up at the museum for one of our tours, your guide is waiting in the entrance hall. They dress sharp, they've got a smile on their face, and they've got a tag with your name on it. You join a small group of about six or seven individuals, six or seven customers per tour. And from the moment that they start, it's like no other museum tour. Your guide says, listen, this museum is enormous. The Metropolitan Museum of Art is 2.3 million square feet. It's 13 acres of Central Park. I can't show you all of it, but I can show you my favorites. And so in order for us to see that, they, the guide tells them, we're going to have to act as a team. Together, we have to go fast. And so the guide says, I need everybody to put your hands in the middle. Everybody puts their hands in the middle. <laughs> And they say, we're going to begin this museum tour. We're going to go through those doors into the museum. But first, we're going to start with a cheer. We're going to say the word museum. <laughs> so they put their hands in, and they go, museum. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's how the tours begin. Every single tour starts that way. And that's because we set the pace in. If the tours are led with the heart and soul of our tour guides, they're driven by the pacing. We go very fast. Have you ever been to a museum and when you leave, you feel, you feel tired? Or you feel like guilty that you didn't see everything? That's a real condition. It's called gallery fatigue, and it happens because as you look at objects, you deplete the glucose levels, you're making decisions, you get tired on museum tours. We have activities during our tours to combat that. We call these games fatigue fighters. <laughs> We've been known to lead stretching and yoga and squats in the museum <laughs> to get people energized and engaged and alert. We do water breaks, we pass out candy, we are not afraid to talk about things that regular museum guides would never talk about. We'll take you to this object, made in 1620 by a German artist. It was donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art by J. Pierpont Morgan, who was an incredible collector. He spent over a billion dollars in the last years of his life collecting art that he later gave to the museum. most of which he donated to the Met. He was a collector of collections. This is one of those objects. It's incredible because of that story. It's also incredible because you're looking at a 17th century drinking game. 
I'm not kidding you. This head of the stag, that's Diana and the stag, the head is removable. It's a drinking vessel. It would have been used when your party in 1625 is getting a little slow. <laughs> you remove the head, you fill it up with a beverage of your choice, put it back together, and the bottom, it's an automaton. It's got a system of metal gears and levers. You screw it up, it winds around the table spinning. The person it lands in front of pops the head off and chugs it back. <laughs> your party has been restarted. <laughs> This object is in a case of other drinking vessels, things that revolve around alcohol. And we sh take people to that. We show them. We get them interested in these objects. We talk to them about sometimes taboo subjects, like how much things cost. We'll take them to the most expensive work of art that the museum has ever paid cash money for. It's this tiny, tiny object from the year 1300 by an artist named Duccio. He was a pre-Renaissance master. There's only 13 other known Duccios in the entire world. The museum bought this in 2004. Every other one was owned by a major museum. It was their last chance to acquire a Duccio. We take people to the highlights, and we tell them the juicy gossip behind it. Why did they pay so much for this? How did that spin out? What was it like? The number one thing we hear from people who go on our tours is that I've never had so much fun in a museum before. They say, I didn't know museums could be this much fun. And I see that as my job. My job is to get people excited about museums who usually think that they're boring and tired. Because if I can get them excited on one visit, I hope that they'll come back again, and maybe some of them will develop a relationship. People on our tours, we do activities to get them engaged. People love to take pictures. We'll show you where to go pose with your friends to look like Gossip Girl. We'll tell you where you can go in the museum to make out with your boyfriend. For enough money, we'll even help you propose to your girlfriend. The photos are a really important piece because it's about sharing your experience. And let's be honest, you look awesome in a museum. <laughs> we give people pictures, physical artifacts that they can take home with them after the tour to remember the experience that they had with us. We play games, we give prizes, we tell stories, and we lead by passion. Um, that's what we do. It's a pretty simple business. Um, I love doing it, and I've spent the better part of the last three years of my life being obsessed with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and now creating a business that does that. We do museum tours for people who don't like museums. I'm not going to get rich doing this. It's a low-tech, high-touch business. It's a business that I started not as a nonprofit, but as a business because I wanted our company to serve only one person, and that was the customer. I thought if we went the nonprofit route, we would have to answer to an institution or an organization that had goals different than my own. Let's be clear, we're a private company working in the public sphere. We are the top layer of premium service that couldn't exist without the awesome curators and museum employees who do what they do every single day. But my company allows us to do something totally different. It allows us to speak with a non-institutional voice to people. It lets us say things that you would never hear on a regular museum tour. I'll take you into this room and tell you about the amazing architecture and the Rococo furniture, but I'll, I'll also just tell you that Rococo is a French word for frilly gold shit. <laughs> the greatest compliment that I've ever received from someone who came on our tours 
uh, came from a friend of mine who directs music videos. He came on the tour, and at the end of it, it really touched me. He said, Nick, I've been through this museum for the last two hours, and I've looked at these objects that are 100, that are 500, that are 1,000 years old, and I look at the work that I do, and I look at these objects that are 100 and 500 and 1,000 years old, and I think about what I'm doing. And will it stand the test of time? And he said, this is what was so powerful. He said, being in this museum makes me want to create better things. Being, this, being in this museum makes me want to do better in life. I want to create things that withstand the test of time. My favorite piece in the entire museum, the number one thing I want to steal, is an Egyptian work. It may look new to you, but in fact, it's over 3,000 years old. It's called Fragment of a Queen's Face, and it's made out of a material called yellow jasper. Yellow jasper is a semi-precious stone that is both, one, very hard to work with, and two, incredibly rare. At the time this was made, it was so rare that the next largest piece of yellow jasper was no bigger than your thumbnail. We don't know exactly who it is. It could be Nefertiti. It could be a woman named Queen T. There's a lot of mystery around it. This material, yellow jasper, is so hard to work with on the hardness scale with diamond as a number seven and marble a number three, it's a solid five. It makes marble look like a stick of butter. I was talking to a curator about this piece and I told him I'm obsessed with this object. And he said, more incredible is that we have no clue how it was made. The level of detail on the lower lip, we don't know how it was made and more so, we have no surviving examples of the tools that could have been used to create it. This woman was listening to us and she stuck her head in and she said, I bet it was the aliens. <laughs> she did not work at the museum. By the way. I look at this object and I think about what it was like when it was originally made. It was broken on purpose. I like that the museum didn't try to recreate the rest of the face. It makes me think if the lips looked like this, can you imagine what the rest of it looked like? She would have been presented to the pharaoh wearing a Nubian wig, maybe a dress made entirely out of feathers. Her hands and feet would have been made of yellow jasper. I look at this piece, and what I see are some very juicy lips. <laughs> I look at this, and I get butterflies in my stomach. And to me, that's what a great piece of art is. 3,000 years ago, I couldn't talk to an Egyptian. I couldn't read their language. I didn't know hieroglyphics. And yet today, I can look at this, and I can feel something. I believe that a great piece of art is something that can communicate through time. My name is Nick Ray, my museum, my business is called Museum Hack, and I think that museums are fucking awesome. Yeah.